Good morning, dear students. Uh, my name is Farhan Mazar, and today is 4th of May 2022. Right now, I am with the 11 Cambridge class, and the subject we are studying is Physics 5054. This is Cambridge O Levels uh, Physics, and the code of the subject is 5054. Today, we have set our hearts to solve a theory paper, and we call it Paper 2. And we have selected May, June 2011 2 2 paper. This paper 2 belongs from the zone 2 or the variant 2. And in this video, in this session, in this class, today we are going to solve the section B of this paper. The section B starts from the question number 9. And it's, it's 9, 10, and 11 question. So there are three questions which we'll solve in this video. The section A of this paper I have already solved and it is uploaded in the you, my YouTube channel. And you can find that video in the same playlist where you find this video. So let's start today's paper and here we go. So the question paper, uh, this is the section B of the May, June 2011 2-2 paper. Figure 9.1 shows a skydiver falling vertically. The skydiver starts from the rest at time t equals to zero. His acceleration is non-uniform until he reaches a steady speed of 50 meters per second at t equals to 10 seconds. He opens his parachute at t equals to 20 seconds and decelerates until t equals to 25 seconds. From t equals to 25 seconds, he falls at a steady speed of 5 meters per second. On the figure 9.2, draw the speed time graph uh, for the skydiver. So here we are, speed time graph is given to us. On the y-axis, we have speed, and on the x-axis, we have time. So he says the at the start, his speed was 0, so you put a dot on 0, 0, and he accelerated non-uniformly till time 10 seconds. At 10 seconds, he gained the speed of 50. So at 10 seconds, 10 comma 50, put a dot here and join them with, uh, with, uh, with the decreasing, with a curve, increasing curve, but with the decreasing, its gradient should be decreasing gradually. And then from 10 to 20 second, he moves with the speed of 50. So put a dot on 20 comma 50. And then from he, at 20, he opens his parachute. So he decelerates at time t25, his speed decrease from 50 to five. So put a dot on 25 comma five. And after 25, he, 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 he continues with the constant speed of five. So here you will have a horizontal line. So let me show you how this is drawn. He says, uh, draw this on the graph. So let me show you, I have already drawn it. So let me show you. So we go to the question number nine, sorry for that. Okay, so you see here, uh, 0 comma 0 and 10 comma 50, 20 comma 50, 25 comma 5, and then a horizontal line. So here the, the acceleration was non-uniform. So we will put a curve like this. Its gradient is gradually decreasing. So hopefully you understand that how we have drawn this. Okay, so let's have a look at the marking scheme of the curve with the decreasing gradient from origin to 0, 50 meter per second at 10 second, constant speed from 10 to 20 seconds, decreases to 5 meter per second at 25 seconds, constant speed from 25 seconds until at at, at least 50 seconds. So our, our graph is perfect. Okay, so go to the next question. He says, state how your graph shows that the acceleration is non-uniform between T0 to T10 seconds. We have drawn that graph and we have drawn that graph in the shape of a curve. This curve shows that the, uni the acceleration is non-uniform because the gradient is changing. The gradient of the speed time graph is equal to the acceleration. From zero to 10 seconds, we have shown that speed time graph's gradient is gradually changing. So the acceleration is changing. So acceleration is non-uniform. So, okay, from T0 to T10 seconds, speed time graph is a curve. Its gradient is not constant. Its gradient is gradually changing. So that is my answer. 
So let's look at the marking scheme or the marking scheme. Gradient slope, not constant, decreases, graph curve, graph, not a straight line, increases in the speed uh, per uh, second, unit time not equal. Okay, so our answers are right. Okay, so I'm going to next, explain in detail why after the skydiver opens his parachute, he decelerates and eventually reaches a steady speed. You see when he opens his parachute, his surface area becomes very large. And when the surface area becomes very large, the, um, the air resistance becomes larger than his weight. So when the air resistance becomes larger than his weight, the direction of the resultant force is in the upward direction. The parachutist is falling downward, but the resultant force is in the upward direction. So when the resultant force is opposite to the motion of a body, that resultant force creates deceleration. And that's, that, that is the reason the speed decreases. And when the speed decreases, the value of the air resistance gradually decreases and the air resistance eventually becomes equals to the weight and the resultant force becomes zero and the body starts falling with the constant speed of five meter per second. So that is our answer. It's a four mark question, very technical answer. So when the parachute is opened, surface area becomes larger, air resistance becomes larger than the weight. Resultant force will be in the upward direction while body will fall down. So the deceleration in the upward direction will be produced. Speed will start decreasing. And so the air resistance will decrease and become equals to weight. And then the resultant, will, resultant force will become equal to zero. So when I hope you understand what I have written, so the, uh, it says four marks, it's a four mark question. Any mention of the air resistance drag in the upward force? Initially the force upwards larger than the force downward, resultant force upwards, air resistance decreases with the fall in the speed. At constant speed, air resistance friction drag equals the weight, force up and down balanced, so that is zero resultant force. Our answer is perfect, so you can write that answer. C part, for the time interval, uh, T equals to 10 seconds and T is 20 seconds. Calculate the distance that the skydiver falls. That is equals to the area under the speed time graph. So from T10 to T20, area under the speed time graph is in the form of a rectangle. Find the area of this rectangle. That will be length into width. The length is 10 and the width is 50. Just multiply 10 with the 50 and you will uh, get, you will get the distance traveled. And you know, the area under, under the speed time graph for that time duration, that, we, that is in the shape of a rectangle length into width, 10 into 50, and that is 500 meter. So the distance traveled, distance is 500 meters. So our answer is right, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next part. He says, uh, the mass of the skydiver is 60 kg for the time interval between T20 second and T25 second. Calculate the average deceleration of the skydiver from 20 to 25 second. At 20, the speed was 50 and at 25, the speed is five. So we can find, uh, you can find the deceleration. The deceleration formula is uh, I have taken two points on the graph at 20, 50 and 25, 5. And the gradient of the graph is equal to the deceleration. So it will be 5 minus 50 divided by 25 minus 20. So it will be minus 45 divided by 5. And that will be minus 9 meter per second square. That's the value of the deceleration. Because we are using the word deceleration, that's why I will not put negative sign in the answer because the word deceleration is being used here. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the marking scheme. It's nine meter per second squared. Our answer is right, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next part. He says calculate the average resultant force acting on the skydiver. Once you know the deceleration uh, and you know the mass of the skydiver, so I can find the resultant force, Newton's second law of motion, F is equals to MA. We know the mass, we know the A value. So I can calculate the uh, resultant force. 
So F is equals to MA, F equals to 60 multiply 9, and that will be 540 Newton. So the resultant force acting on the skydiver is 540 Newton. 540 Newton is the right answer, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next part. He says, state how your graph in the figure 9.2 may be used to obtain the distance that a skydiver falls. Find the area under the speed time graph, and that will be equal to the distance traveled. So here is my answer. Calculate the area under the speed time graph. So let's look at the marking scheme, what the marking scheme has to say. The marking scheme says area under the graph or the line or the curve. So that was question number nine. Hopefully you understand how we have done this. Question number 10, describe an experiment to measure the critical angle for light in glass or perspex. You answer should include a labeled diagram. Okay, so it's, it's, let me show you how much marks it carries. It has five marks. Huge question, huge, huge part, I mean. So uh, the methodology is very simple. You take a semicircular glass block and you put it on a paper and you mark its boundaries and where your straight edges and on the on that straight edge put a dot and then put a normal there and then put the glass semicircle glass block back again there take a ray box and uh, and with the ray box shine the light and direct it at the at the at, at that point which was the midpoint of that uh, straight edge of that semicircle glass block. And the light will emerge on the other side from the straight face, the light will emerge. Okay, we, on this incident ray, put two dots on the paper and where the light emerges, put two dots on it. So, so you see, this is a simple thing. Then move actually the ray box towards the left a little bit. So when you will move the ray box uh, towards the left here, where the light emerges and the light uh, emergent light will start going towards the straight edge so at a certain position when you are going from further left 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 you will see that the emergent ray will come on this boundary at a certain angle or on a certain position uh, this emergent ray will start moving on the boundary between uh, between the glass and the air so stop it and where this light on this incident ray put two dots on the paper on this emergent ray put two dots on the paper and then remove everything join the the dot p1 and p2 with this midpoint join p3 and the p4 with this midpoint and then this will be your incident ray and that will be your emergent ray here the angle of refraction has become 90 and you know the critical angle is that angle of incidence in the dense medium for which the angle of refraction in the rare medium is of 90 degree. So measure this angle of incidence, that is the angle between this incident ray and the normal. That angle of incidence for which the angle of refraction here is 90 degree, that angle of incidence is the critical angle. Hopefully you understand, I've tried to write it and but it has taken too much space, but let's read this and you can, you can try to squeeze it. Take a semicircular glass block, put it on a white paper, mark its boundaries, remove it, and at the midpoint of the straight edge, mark its midpoint and draw a normal at that point. Use a ray box for the light ray, put back the glass block on the paper, direct the ray box towards the curved face of the glass block, mark the position of the incident and the emergent ray by putting dots on the paper. Increase the angle of incidence by moving the ray box to the left until the emergent ray starts moving on the straight edge of the glass block. Mark the position of the incident ray and emergent ray on the paper. Measure the angle of incidence by use of a protector for which the angle of refraction is um, um, a 90 degree angle of incidence is equals to the critical angle. That angle of incidence will be equals to the critical angle will be of the 90 degree. But I wrote this answer, but this answer has taken too much space. It's a five mark question. So let's check from the marking scheme. What it does the marking scheme says? He says suitable block, semicircular, rectangular prism, suitable source of ray, for example, ray box pins or incident ray, laser, not torch, 
must be labeled on the diagram or clear in the text diagram showing incident ray in the glass perspex, no arrow needed. Uh, and correct refraction out into the air adjustment of the angle of incidence ray until along the surface just no longer emerges my ear correct angle marked or described clearly or C marked on the diagram. So our answer is 100% perfect. The only problem is it has taken too much space. Okay, so we are going to the next part. That's the B part on the, because he says, he says figure 10.1 represents a simple camera. So this is basically a camera. Here we have the photographic film. Here we have the lens of the camera. Here is the object. State the type of the lens used in the simple camera. In camera, we always use a converging or convex lens, converging lens, or, or you call it convex lens. Then he says, draw two rays from the top of the object to show how the image is formed on the film. Mark and label the image on the film. Okay, so we are talking about this. Okay, so here we go. Convex lens or converging lens. And this is, you start from the head of the object, pass to the optical center of the lens, and it goes undeviated. Okay. Join the top of the head with this point and then make it parallel to the principal axis. So where these two intersects, an image will be formed on the photographic film. Hopefully you understand. So let's look at the one. Converging or convex lens ray, rays from the top through the middle of the lens, undeviated other ray from top of the object to the same position on the film. Correct image label drawn marked. Ratio, okay, so the next question coming up on your screen, he says, define the term linear magnification. Linear magnification means the ratio of the height of the image to the height of the object. Another definition can be the ratio of the distance of the image from the optical center of the lens to the distance of the object from the optical center of the lens. These are the two definitions. You only have to write the one of, one of them. So the ratio of the height of the image to the height of the object. That is my answer. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. The marking scheme ratio of the size, height, length, distance of the image to the size, height, length, distance of the object. Okay, so our definition is right. He says, find a figure 10.1 is drawn to the scale, determine the linear magnification object shown in the figure 10.1. So we want to find out the linear magnification. So Mayer, uh, what is the distance of the image and from the lens and what is the distance of the object from the lens? Uh, I have measured it, that is three divided by 7.5 and it's 0 0.4. Then I have measured the line, I have tried to find the linear magnification by the height of the image to the height of the object. Height of the image is 0 0.8 centimeter and the height of the, uh, sorry, height of the image is 0 0.8 and the height of the object is 1.9. So the magnification is 0 0.42, both magnifications are 0 0.4, and which is the right answer, and 0 0.4 to 0 0.05 plus minus in it. Okay, our answers are right. So then he says, uh, okay, here we go. Apart from its size state, one other property of the image formed by the lens, this image formed is real, it is inverted. Okay, it is inverted and it's diminished. So the image is real or image is inverted. You can write anything. Okay, so the, it says uh, upside down inverted real other, other side of the lens to object nearer lens than the object, otherwise not, okay. So that's next thing. Explain why when taking the photographs of other objects, it may be necessary to move the lens towards the film the reason why you move the lens towards the film when you are taking the photos of other objects, if the image is not formed on the um, of the photographic film, the image will be the, the the photo will be not clear. So you have to move the lens forward or backward. Here in this case, he says he moved the lens towards the film so that the image can be formed on the photographic film and the image will become sharp and clear. So let's have a look at my answer and then we will go to the, okay. When the image of an object is formed in front of the film, so it's not on the film. So the image will be not clear on the photographic film. To bring that image on the film, lens is moved towards the film. Okay, 
to get a sharp and focused image. So what that what what their answer is? He says otherwise not focused to adjust focus to produce a clear and sharp image. Otherwise rays do not converge on the film. To rays film rays on to convert the rays onto the film image on film object at different distance. Otherwise image formed in front of the film object now further. So our answer is right. So uh, question number 11, that's the last part of this, uh, the last question of this paper. This last question answer was not that easy to answer. He says in an experiment to measure the specific heat capacity of water, an electric heater heats water in a glass beaker. The temperature of the water is measured at regular intervals of time. Figure 11.1 shows how the temperature varies with the time. So here the time is given on the x-axis, on the y-axis, the time is representing, it's a heating curve, you are raising the temperatures. Zero second, 100 seconds, 200 seconds, 300 second, temperature 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. Using the figure 11 point, he says, using the figure 11, using the figure 11.1 to determine the change in the temperature between T0 to T100. So when the temperature, when the time is zero, the temperature is 20. When the time is 100, the temperature looks like 70 something. Okay, one, two, three. One, two, three, four. Or maybe five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, the temperature is 70. So how much is the change in the temperature? That is 70 minus uh, 20. And the temperature change is 50 degrees. So, okay. So the next question they are asking you is that, uh, let's have 50. Okay. The next question they are asking is, when that from T100 second to T200 seconds, okay. At 100, the temperature is 70. At 200, the temperature is mm, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it's 9.95, I think, yeah. From 70 to 95, it means the change in the temperature is 25, okay? So that 95 minus 70, the change in temperature is 25. So in first 100 seconds, the temperature has increased by 50 degrees centigrade, but in the second 100 seconds, it, the temperature has only changed 25 seconds, okay? Same time interval, but the rise in the temperature is different. Okay, so their question, our answers are right. Okay, so next the question, state and explain why the values in one are different. Because you see, uh, the time interval given for the two temperature rises is same. From zero to 100 second, you gave 100 second. And from 100 to 200 seconds, you gave again 100 seconds. So, but the rise in the temperature is different. Uh, we believe that the rate of heat uh, the rate of the heat is same, heating is same. So, but the rise in temperature is different. The, what, has, what is the basic reason? The basic reason is uh, in the second hundred second, uh, you know the temperature of the water has increased. So the rate of evaporation will also increase. Rate of evaporation is a loss of heat. The heat you are providing is used in evaporation and the hot water, the, the, the molecules who have higher kinetic energy, they are leaving. So, because the rate of evaporation has increased, that's why the temperature has not uh, increased that much. So let, let's 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 check my answer. The temperature increase in first hundred second is 50, 50 degrees centigrade. Temperature increase in the next hundred second is twenty five degrees centigrade. Uh, reason is water is hotter, so heat loss from the water due to the evaporation has increased during the one hundred second to two hundred seconds duration. So that is my answer. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. Heat loss or evaporation mentioned molecules escape liquid or to vapors, more heat loss or more evaporation, et cetera, because temperature is higher. Because the temperature is higher, that's why that the rate of evaporation has increased. So that is that's why the more heat loss. That's why in the last 100 seconds, 100 seconds to 200 seconds, during that 100 second, the, the rise in the temperature is less. Okay, so then, then I could describe and explain what happens to the water if the heating is continued. You see, if you keep on heating the water, the temperature of the water will start, it, it will rise, 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 rise. 
so obviously at the end what will happen it's uh, it's uh, boiling point will reach and the molecules of the uh, and the water will start boiling yeah you see let's let's check it what uh, water still starts boiling when and the, the start the water will start boiling when its boiling point 100 degrees centigrade is reached temperature of the water will become steady during the boiling so during the boiling the no more temperature will rise okay let's look at alma temperature becomes 100 degrees centigrade which is boiling point temperature becomes steady water boils water turns to steam or gas okay so the water will turn to steam okay the water will start boiling yeah you can say okay 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 so we are going to the next question the experiment in the a is repeated using 72 gram of water the heater supplies 7400 joules of thermal energy to water and the temperature rise of the water is 23 degrees centigrade calculate the specific heat capacity of the water whenever the temperature changes we use the formula heat is equals to mc delta theta where m is the mass c is the specific heat capacity and delta theta means that the change in the temperature so very simple and straightforward question we can solve it very easily so heat is equals to mc delta theta c will be equals to heat divided by m and divided by delta theta 7400 divided by 72 divided by 23 and the answer will be 4.47 joules per gram per degree centigrade 4.47 okay so let's check the marking scheme 4.47 okay so our answer is right okay so dear students so we are going to the next part he says a bullet of mass 72 gram is fired from a gun at a speed of 450 meter per second calculate the kinetic energy of the bullet so we have to calculate the kinetic energy of the bullet the formula is 1 by 2 mv square kinetic energy formula is 1 by 2 mv square but the mass must be taken in the kg so we will convert the mass 72 gram into kg so here we have 1 by 2 mv square 1 divided by 2 72 divided by 1000 to convert into kg so uh, into 4 450 square and the answer will be 7 let's have a look at the marking scheme so our answer is right sir okay then he says uh, the amount of internal energy gained by the water and the amount of the kinetic energy gained by the bullet are approximately equal describe the change in the motion of the molecule of the water and of the molecules of the bullet that is that this addition of the energy has caused you see the molecules of the water will start moving faster they will move little away from each other but the molecules of the water they will be moving in random directions they will be moving throughout the body of the liquid in the in the clusters and every water molecule has a different different velocity or speed in the bullet the bullet is fired so all the molecules of the bullet they are going in the same direction with the same speed so that is my idea so let's have a look what i have written here molecules of water start moving faster they move randomly throughout the liquid in the form of clusters the molecules of bullet all move away from the gun at the same speed they all are moving in the same direction okay so let water molecules move vibrate faster more vigorously water molecules random motion move more throughout the liquid or direction slide over each other move in convection it more often more further apart by the bullet molecules motion in one direction away from the gun towards the target all have the same increase in the speed okay increase in the speed oh that's a very important word okay so here we go question number uh, 11 and it's uh, ninth uh, c part is is a thermocouple is used in experiments in the a a and you know uh, in the space below draw a label diagram of a thermocouple thermometer show clearly the part of the thermo thermocouple that is placed in the water in this experiment so that is the last part of this paper so we have to draw a diagram of the thermocouple so here we go 
So here you can see I have used two metal wires. One is made of iron, the other one is made of the copper. In the copper wire, I put a voltmeter here. Both the metal wires have joined with each other, here joined with each other. Here you put melting ice, we call it the cold junction. Here you put, uh, this is called the hot junction. Here you put that thing whose temperature you want to measure. So the hot water will be put, will be here in the hot junction. Water should be put in the hot juncture. So that's the last part. So let's let's have a look at the marking scheme. And he says two different metals at any junction, two outside wires. If three use join, we use only two wires. Join wires connected to, to meter, voltmeter, ammeter, galvanometer. Okay, so uh, my dear students, thank you very much for taking out time to watch this video and solve this paper with me. It's a great blessing for me to be able to teach you online. If you find this video interesting and useful, and you are able to practice the physics paper by sitting at your home, just by watching on a smart TV, on a smartphone, please subscribe my channel, like this video, share the link of this video, on your onto your Facebook accounts and onto your Instagram accounts and onto your Twitter accounts. Also, the also share the link of these videos with your junior students. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a great blessing for me to be able to teach you online. Thank you very much once again. Have a good day. God bless you all.